we're, this uh, panel is titled um, Modernism and Beyond, and we're going to have two uh, talks. The first is by Ilana Shilo. Ilana Shilo is lecturer and head of the English program in the Academic Center of Law and Business in Ramat Gan. She received her PhD in American Literature from Tel Aviv University, where she taught in the Department of English. She is the author of uh, two books, Paul Oster and Postmodern Quest is the first, and um, The Double, The Labyrinth, and The Locked Room, Metaphor of Paradox in Crime Fiction and Film is the second. She's published a wide range of articles on contemporary fiction and film, and her fields of interest are postmodernism, existentialism, and ethics, the ethics and psychology of evil, art theory, and rock music. And Ilana's title for us today is On the Road to New Horizons with Hana and Paul Oster. Am I tall enough for this? No. The relationship between a student and her doctoral advisor is no less exciting, challenging, and fraught with potential pitfalls than the relationship of a romantic couple. If they are to succeed and flourish, both kinds of relationship require the same basic characteristics, interest, trust, enrichment, encouragement, and support. Romantic attraction is predicated on our interest in what our partner has to offer. We trust that he will not fail us when we need his encouragement and support, and that our life will be enriched by the qualities of his spirit. Similarly, the relationship between a doctoral student and her advisor must be predicated not only on the student's interest in the subject matter, but also on her interest in her mentor's contribution to the subject matter. Like the other kind of relationship, the student advisor rapport requires mutual trust. The student must have confidence in her advisor. This goes without saying. But the trust must go both ways. The advisor must have confidence in the student's potential to develop and spread her wings. In personal, as well as in academic settings, narrowness of mind, dogmatism, and scathing criticism are crippling and paralyzing. Open-mindedness and generosity of spirit allow us to bloom and flourish. This open-mindedness and generosity of spirit are the qualities that characterize Hannah as my advisor. I came to Hannah as a mature student after a long break in my academic studies, a break which had inevitably resulted in some degree of intellectual ignorance and stagnation. Hannah was willing to accept me, even though my research into the writing of the then only emerging American novelist Paul Oster was going to be rather far from her own specialized field. She was the perfect mentor, asking the right questions, commenting on my work in a helpful way, and most of all, giving me a lot of confidence to work independently. It is because of this confidence that my dissertation and subsequent book about Paul Oster have not become the crowning point of my academic career, but rather the springboard for lifelong research into aspects of culture that I find interesting, such as detective fiction, paradoxes and metaphors, body representations, transgressive practices, emotion and literature in cinema, narrative renditions of time and space. I have touched upon most of these topics in my study about Oster, but the process I have undergone with Hannah gave me the tools and discipline to research them in depth and the confidence to voice my ideas in writing. So thank you for the first time, Hannah. More will come on. I was also fortunate to gain an intimate access to Hannah's own research by translating into Hebrew her insightful study, City Codes. 
Hannah's study foreground setting in the reading and writing of narrative, and specifically maps the modern urban novel as a text in which the boundaries dividing private and public space disappear. The thematic focus of Hannah's book is thus the notion of space. And in that respect, it converges with the thematic kernel of my research about Oster. A research I entitled Paul Oster and Postmodern Quest on the Road to Nowhere. When I was asked to give a title to my talk today, I thought about On the Road to New Horizons with Hannah and Paul Oster. On the one hand, the metaphor of New Horizons accurately reflects the outcome of my doctoral research under Hannah's guidance. But it also figuratively, figuratively suggests the topic of my present talk, Oster's narrative treatment of space and time. The Oxford Dictionary defines horizon as the line at which the, the Earth's surface and the sky appear to meet. Appear is a key word here, for as we all know, the horizon recedes as we move towards it. That is, our movement, which happens in time, affects our perception of space. The concept of horizon thus conflates the concept of space and time. Space and time are fundamental perceptual categories. They form the cognitive grid through which we interpret experience. These categories do not necessarily reflect the nature of objective reality. Our concepts of space and time are socially and culturally conditioned. The view of time as linear is inherently Western and, most, and was most influentially formulated in Newton's Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, published in 1687. Newton founded classical mechanics on the premise that space and time are real entities. He granted the time and space an absolute ontological status. This view was, in turn, challenged by Einstein's general theory of relativity, according to which space and time are dynamic quantities. When a body moves or a force acts, it affects the curvature of space and time. And in turn, the structure of space-time affects the way in which bodies move and forces act. Space and time, believed Einstein, not only affect, but are also affected by everything that happens in the universe. Temporal and spatial relationships are also essential to our understanding of narrative. Ever since Aristotle, we have traditionally thought of narrative in linear terms and conceived of it as a causally related sequence of events with a beginning, a middle, and an end. This view implies temporality and spatiality as events unfold in time and take place in physical locations. But our concept of narrative has changed in the wake of 20th century re reconceptualizations of the notions of time and space. According to Lyotard, postmodern science itself, quote, is changing the meaning of the word knowledge, of the word knowledge, provoking not the known, but the unknown. In our era, both science and literature have combined to problematize, to problematize our deeply entrenched notions of the real, as framed by our perception of spatiality and temporality. Oster explores this problematization of the real in his 2008 novel, Men in the Dark. The novel centers around the figure of an aged literary critic who, following a car accident in which his leg was shattered, secludes himself in the darkness of his bedroom. Tortured by the tragedy and terror of personal and national history, August Brill, the titular man in the dark, attempts to put himself to sleep by telling himself stories. Quote, they might, not, they might not add up to much, he admits, 
But as long as I'm, as I'm inside them, they prevent me from thinking about the things I would prefer to forget. The things he is most desperately trying to forget are a personal disaster and a national disaster that are intertwined. The beheading of his beloved granddaughter's boyfriend by Iraqi troops and America's invasion of Iraq. Physically and emotionally broken, Brill imagines a story that begins with the second man in the dark, Owen Brick, who awakes himself in a hole in the ground in a completely different America. The America in which the fictional character imagined by Oster's fictional character finds himself is a nation in which George W. Bush, Bush's 2000 victory against Al Gore had been rejected by the Supreme Court, provoking the abolition of the Electoral College, a subsequent succession, and a civil war between democratic and federal states. He hasn't imagined uh, Donald Trump. In an interview with Gil Tamari concerning Men in the Dark, Oster said, I have had this eerie sense that ever since the 2000 elections in the United States, when Al Gore was voted president, he was the president and the Republicans stole it from him. Ever since this thing happened, this nightmarish thing, I feel we have been living in parallel worlds. The real world is the world in which Al Gore is finishing his second term. There is no war in Iraq, maybe not even a 9-11. And the shadow world is the one we have been living in with our bodies in the last eight years. Oster's comment on his book illustrates the inversion of the real and of the imaginary, which is one of the hallmarks of the postmodern era. The televised representation of the events of 9-11 is perhaps the strongest case in point, as succinctly explained by Zalman Rushdie. Quote, we all crossed a frontier that day, an invisible boundary between the imaginable and the unimaginable. And it turned out to be the unimaginable that was real. And even more to the point, Slavoj Žižek argued that, quote, in contrast to the Barthesian Effet du Réel, in which the text makes us accept its fictional product as real, here the real itself, in order to be sustained, has to be perceived as a nightmarish, unreal spectre. Oster's response to the real aspect of the nightmare and the nightmarish aspect of the real is the creation of parallel words. In the parallel word conceived in Brill's mind, Owen Brick is charged with the metafictional task to kill his creator, be, quote, because he invented the war. And everything that happens or, or is about to happen is in his head. Eliminate that head and the war stops, believes Brick. But Brill eventually lets his protagonist die thereby virtually saving his own life and putting an end to the nightmare that he invented in order to forget the real life nightmare etched in his memory. Brill's termination of his story has a therapeutic effect. He summons the strength to remember the trauma properly, convinces his granddaughter to accept the footage of her boyfriend's death so that she can start living again, gets his crutches, and leaves his locked room. The locked room is the focal spatio-temporal trope of Men in the Dark. It is the topographical setting of the novel and a metaphor of the writer's imagination. It is the place where time bifurcates and then becomes one again. It is a locus of solitude and containment, but also of boundless freedom. It contains the memory of trauma, and enables its integration. It is a place where the writer must live, but which he eventually has to leave if he wishes to face new horizons. The locked room is one of Oster's favorite metaphors, which I have discussed at length in my dissertation. 
My dissertation focused on the useless quest of ostrich protagonists, who often find themselves on the road to nowhere. The road, the horizon, bifurcating time, the locked room, the topics I have raised in my present talk are all metaphors. We can't help using metaphors, for language is metaphorical. So I'd like to conclude this talk in the same metaphorical vein and express my gratitude to Hannah for generously guiding me in my quest for new horizons. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs>